Hi, I'm Ted Wolf, presented by Guidewise. Welcome to the Implementers Podcast, where we connect you to the stories and insights of people who have mastered implementation. Why? Because ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. Join us as we uncover the secrets of successful implementation so you can conquer your implementation struggles. Welcome to the Implementers Podcast, presented by Guidewise, where we focus on the topic of implementation because ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. Today, I'd like to welcome my guest, Tony Lockwood. He comes to us from the United Kingdom. Tony, tell us a little bit about your background and welcome. Well, thank you, Ted. It's uh, great to be here. Um, my background, um, I banking background originally, and I um, was fortunate enough to get involved in the McKinsey-led transformation very early on in my career. Uh, and after running a whole series of projects within, within that program, um, I moved back into steady-state banking, uh, but realized after six months or so that I preferred change and transformation to banking. Um, and I made the move into consulting um, just over 25 years ago. Uh, and ever since, been helping organizations, um, global, local, uh, large and small, change and drive transformational change primarily, moving one from one state to another. Um, and been doing that um, sometimes independently, sometimes through some of the bigger consultancies, and over the last um, six months or so with FSP. Tell us a little bit about FSP, if you could. Yeah, FSP are a, a mid-sized consulting practice uh, based in the United Kingdom, but we've, we've, we've got operations across Europe. Um, we are historically a digital transformation and cybersecurity consultancy. Um, I joined along with a, a couple of other people to help them build out the more sort of trans uh, transformational advisory practice, um, looking at working with the other C-suite members other than just the CIO, which traditionally the uh, FSP have dealt with, have worked with. And your area of focus is principally transformation and change management within organizations. Am I correct in that? Absolutely. Yes, it, it's uh, that's my, been my focus for the last 25 years now. Why do you choose that focus? How did you come about to find that space? Uh, it's, it's an interesting question. And um, I think like many people that operate in this space, almost fell into it by accident. Um, I was in the right place at the right time uh, within the bank, um, working within one department that was a was a key part to driving the transformation or the change that the bank wanted to do. So I started off as a subject matter expert, but then moved into running individual projects and programs within that transformation program. And as I say, off the back of that, I realized that there was a lot of fun to be had in that. It was a lot of challenge. There's a lot of um, the skills, a lot of the skills that I had would naturally help to blend and, and, and drive projects and programs to success. Um, and I, it, I got the bug, um, and that's kept with me now for, as I say, for 20 plus years. And, uh, I think the, the beauty of it is you get the variation within working with different organizations and different focus for the transformation, but the themes are pretty consistent. So I, I've, I've got my variation from working from in different, different industries, different product uh, sectors and different sizes of organizations. But fundamentally, some of the challenges they're facing have been pretty consistent. So transformation and change is common, <clears throat> excuse me, to every organization you're working with. What is it that prevents good transformation principles or practices, change management practices, from being put in place within an organization? Well, that's a big question. And... Um, I think there's many, many different answers to that. But the, more, the, the most common ones that I've found are, are, two, are two or threefold, really. One, lack of consistent understanding of, of why we're moving towards the place we're moving towards um, and, and, and a lack of clarity around that vision and, and that endpoint. Um, but also then um, the, the, the probably the biggest aspect is whether it's a 
process-led change, whether it's a technology-led change. Fundamentally, it's about people. It's about changing people and taking people on that journey. And I think that's where a lot of uh, organizations historically haven't put sufficient uh, knowledge or focus in that space. So there's a temptation of uh, change fatigue. There's a temptation of, well, if I keep my head down long enough, this thing will go away and someone else will come around in six months' time. That was, that's been quoted to me so many times in organizations. And it's that, you know, you, we, we need to take people on that journey. Sometimes we fail to do that. And what do you find the best way to do that? And, and what I mean by that is organizations sometimes say, yeah, we have to change. They get change management mixed up with strategy. We got this strategy in place, but it's not change management. Is it that they don't get the focus by having the right person in the right position and that maybe somebody has to be in a position of big influence to enforce the transformation? Yeah, I, I agree. I think as a chief transformation officer or transformation director, whatever the title is, that person needs to sit on the C-suite. They need to sit alongside the chief exec um, because they need to have the ability to go across organizations and the functions of the organizations and as opposed to working within one of the, one of the functions. Uh, the challenge is a lot of times the chief transformation officer, the transformation director, reports into a functional lead. And when that happens, you naturally look through the lens of that function when you're looking at transformation. And successful transformation is about taking an organization as a whole, not just looking at it from a technology perspective or a finance perspective or an HR perspective. It's about looking at it from across the organization. And that's, in my, in my experience, um, where when that happens, transformations are successful when it doesn't that they, they, they may become less successful so yeah all i was saying was that there is a uh, his, historically there's been this message that's been played out in lots of um, articles that 70 percent of transformation efforts fail uh, and although that was a mckinsey article from 20 odd years ago it, it, it it's repeated time and time again and when you look at that in detail, it's probably fair to say that most most programs do fail to deliver the benefits that they're expected to deliver, or it takes them longer than they expected, or it costs them more than they expected. And they do deliver benefit, but it may be as a, a percentage of what they expected. And I think so. When you come back and say transformations fail, I think what I'm saying is if you if you've got all of the parts and the key people in place that's looking across, you've got a much higher degree of certainty that you will deliver on time, on budget, and deliver the expected outcome. In transform, making transformation happen in an organization, how important is it to get your small wins and publicize them? Absolutely. Um, again, typically a transformation is multi-year, and the challenge for any transformational leader is to keep the momentum going. And the way to do that is, as you just rightly say, identify those quick wins, build the plan around delivering those quick wins and publicizing them very early on because success breeds success. And the more people see things moving in the right direction, the more that the, the more they'll support it, the more that they'll come on that journey with you. And as we said earlier, the key part of any transformation is to take people on that journey. Does the need for a transformational focus or change management ever end in an organization today? Well, I, I'm, I've got a bit of a focus at the moment to drop the word transformation program because when you have a program, it tends to indicate a start and finish. But transformation these days is an ever-present. Ultimately, the speed of change around technology the political um, elements, the globalization that we all operate within, things are happening. So as, a, as a, an organization, as a transformational leader, yes, you've got to deliver what you've set out to deliver, but equally you've got to keep your head above the parapet and see that that vision that you're moving towards is still relevant. 
and you need to be agile enough to be able to adapt that as you as you move forward. What do you find? I'm going to assume that that you found that an organization needs to bring a focus to the transformational work that needs to be done. And I'm saying that because there's so many things that are changing. Well, what do we focus on? How do we identify the priorities in the areas we need to focus? So I'm going to assume that's why you wrote your book, The Transformational Leader's Book of Knowledge, to kind of organize the mindset and organize, here's the things and points you got to follow, a formula, if you will. Am I accurate in that? Is that why you wrote the book and what you're trying to get across with the book? Yeah, I, I, I think the, the Transformation Leader's Body of Knowledge is, is very much a compendium of processes, uh, approaches, tools that a transformational leader can grab hold of to help drive change and transformation within an organization. And, and it's built around a nine pillar framework. Uh, and, and the key to that, which I've actually trans, uh, translated into a canvas, a transformation canvas, but the key to those nine pillars is that Wherever you enter, whatever the focus of the initial discussion about why transformation is required, and you know the one, the obvious one these days is it's a digital transformation. We've got to do something about AI. We've got to in, in, introduce AI into our business processes, which is may well be the case. But when you look at it just through the lens of AI, you almost tend to forget as the wider impact on the organization so the canvas and the and the framework is very much about yeah look at ai but then look across the nine pillars to get a much uh, better overview oversight of what's required to deliver that transformation successfully tell us then a little bit about what it's like to work with you and how you begin guiding an organization through the transformational process using um, the book of knowledge and the and the the nine pillars, if you will. Yeah, the the first stage of of it tends to be, and and, and I tend to work in um, relatively short, sharp interventions with organisations to help them establish the transformation program or the transformation process. Um, and and the first phase of that is to develop the roadmap, and 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 that's consists of the four, the first four elements of the uh, of the nine pillar framework so that's about getting absolute clarity around the vision what are we trying to achieve and why and what will it look like when we get there once we've got that clarity and vision in that north star what does that mean from a business model perspective how does the business model need to be adapted what's the impact upon how we deliver value to our customers or clients once we've got that in place, how does our operating model need to be adapted? What's, what, how do we need to adapt the processes, the workflows within the organization? And the fourth element of that roadmap is what's the impact on technology, the digital, the data aspects. So once you've got those four things in place and get clarity about what that looks like, what typically spins out of that is a whole series of activities, projects, programs, initiatives. Yeah, and that starts to build up that, that portfolio. Once you've got that in place and get clarity around that, then how are we going to execute it? So we then go into the next three waves uh, elements of the nine pillar framework. What does it mean from a stakeholder perspective, stake, internal stakeholders and external partners? What the impact upon the culture of the organization and how do we need to communicate and keep people on, on board? And what does it mean from a people perspective? So that means looking at have we got the right people in the right place at the right time? Have they got the right skill sets? What training will they need? What change management processes do we need to adopt? And then the final two of the nine pillars is um, what's governance framework and how does that link into the corporate governance framework for the transformation initiative and the financial and benefits realisation piece. So those are the, the, two, the final two of the oversight to the over and the assurance element to the overall transformation. Because so what I do within the typically a 90 days or 120 day process is to map that out for organizations and help them to get clarity around those, uh, around those uh, nine pillars and 
build out the portfolio and, and build out the um, governance structures that they need to have in place uh, and then look to either step away or provide more coaching, mentoring to the internal transformation leader who's driving that initiative forward. Of the nine pillars, where do you find organizations and individuals have the most difficulty? Um, I think getting clarity and alignment on the North Star is always challenging uh, because you usually have um, people with C-suite members that have got you know real beliefs in, in their area and what they want, um, and, and that can sometimes conflict with what other people want and, and what that North Star is. So getting alignment is critical um, and, and can create many challenges. Um, probably the bigger one that is tended, tends to be underplayed but as a significant impact upon successful outcomes is the culture, and it's the it's the most difficult one to change. Um, it's not something that you can just flick a switch and change the culture of an organisation. Um, that can take some time, and, and all too often it's the elephant in the room. Um, so everyone knows there's a cultural change required, but how do you how do you eat an elephant? It's, that's the challenge. It's 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 those small steps in. How do you go about that? It tends to be almost not not ignored, but it's there. People know it's there, but because we don't have a solution to to do anything about it, they, they tend to focus on the other areas. How do you guide them through the change of culture? By being again, it's 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 linking it back to the nine pillars. It, it's being open and transparent with the wider team on why the transformation is required. It's not just because we've we've got up one day and decided that we need to transform. You know, it, there is a, there needs to be a valid reason that people can understand and buy into. Um, there needs to be um, a, an awareness that you know, again, you can't just flick a switch and change culture. You've got to engage with people. And you've got an engagement in the true sense of the word, two-way engagement, not just communicating down in telling, actually engaging and getting people involved in the process of change and and, and identifying those those key people at all, at all levels within the organization that can help you to, to drive that, that, that change through. Um, but as I say, it's not easy. It's really, really challenging. And um, you've, you, as an external going into an organization, I tend to be able to pick up on the challenges, probably more so than the internal people can, because you're listening, you're hearing things. Um, and as, as I said earlier, so many times I've gone into organizations and I heard, I've heard people say, yeah, but you'll go away, you know, six months time, I'll keep my head down, six months you'll be gone, someone else will come in. And that's the culture, and you've got to break that. And, and you know, the first time that I heard that was in a um, public sector organisation within the UK, um, and we were putting in a new system, a new working asset management system, and a programme that should have taken in total probably about 15 months, ended up taking us three and a half years because or not necessarily just because of that, but a big part of it was we just couldn't get people engaged in the process. That the only way we brought that down was to almost go back to them and say, "Well, we're not going to go away. We, this can be really easy for you if you come on the journey. Oh, it can, it, it's, but, but if you don't, if you don't, if you choose not to, it's going to get really hard for you." And and, and it was about being open and transparent it's about the journey we had to go on, why the journey was important, um, and the impact upon the organisation and and them individually if they didn't go on that if they didn't go on that journey. Um, so I think there is a an element of being really open and transparent to people um, and treat them treating them as ad- as adults, you know, um, as opposed to trying to hide 
the hard things that are going to come. Everyone knows that if you're going through change and transformation, it's it's going to be painful at some stage. So why why try to hide it? Be open about it, and and give them advanced warning of when those hardships are going to come. It sounds as though some people are very certain in their the longevity of their position that they're going to outlast you and your effort. So how do you get them out of that comfort zone that I'm safe, I'm okay, I really don't need to change. This is an endeavor. We've gone through this before and I know where they end. How do you, how do you intercede to change that mindset? Well, as, as I've just said, it is about stepping back in and being really clear about what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, change is successful when there's a burning platform. Transformation is successful when there's a burning platform. And everyone, or oh, there's a cliff edge that we're running towards. And if we, if we don't do something, you know, that it's, it's a crash and burn type of situation. And, and I'm not for, for one minute suggesting that you create a, a, a burning platform, but you've got to get people to understand that actually standing still is not an option. We've got to move forward. Um, and, and at that stage, if we can, but by doing that in, in, in explaining the rationale for the change or the transformation, people will either start to lean into it um, or they will become a barrier. And the sooner you can identify those barriers, the better. And, and if, you, if you can identify those barriers, then taking them to one side and, and either turning them around, because if you can turn them around, they be, tend to become really, really strong advocates. So if they're not going to move forward, you've got to, you've got to take the hard decision and move them away from, from the program or the process. And sometimes um, encourage them to, uh, to, to, to look for opportunities elsewhere. Okay. Every organization that goes through change along with every individual that has to do some type of change management or transformation in their life after a while gets tired. Let's call it transformational fatigue. Yeah. How do you manage the pace? Get a burst of energy. As you mentioned, you win in bursts. You get a burst of energy, then you let them rest. Then you get a burst of energy and you get, let them rest. How do you manage that pace so that that transformational fatigue doesn't overtake the entire ongoing endeavor. Yeah, I, I think part of that is planning. Part of that is a, a really focusing upon who needs to be involved and when they need to be involved, um, and try to manage that 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 process so that you're not hitting the same people constantly with 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 you know change because as you say that change fatigue kicks in. Um, and you know, often you, the, the individuals that you want in your um, program, your your you know your change program, your your, your project, have got a day job as well. So you know they that you need them to you need the subject matter experts to be involved, but they've got the got to do the day job. There's so many times I've been involved in in, in programs that are, that are failing, and you sort of look and look at the resource plan. And it's, well, no wonder because you, you've got three people there that you're expecting to do 300% of the time every day. and It doesn't work. They, 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 they burn out. So getting, getting clear about the resource plan and seeing if you can sequence those initiatives um, so that you're minimizing the impact on, on people as, as much as possible. But again, you know, touching, touching back to what we spoke about early, early doors and on, on this, on this uh, discussion, identifying those quick wins. Success does breed success. And if you can constantly keep bringing up successes, passing people on the back, demonstrating that things are being moved forward and, and we're getting the results, that creates, you know, that, that creates momentum. And keeping that momentum going is critical. Um, the other thing I would say is an, 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 anal an, an analogy I use all the time is that as a transformation leader, you're just creating or you, you, you're completing a what I call a jigsaw puzzle. Yeah, so part of that is to create the vision, that North Star, the, the, 
picture on the top of the jigsaw puzzle box. And then you've got all the individual pieces that you're moving around and putting together in ultimately ensuring that they all fit together um, to create that to create that picture. But you'll know if you've ever done a, a jigsaw puzzle, you don't have to follow it in, 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 in a routine way. You, you tend to move around. And that if you've got that flexibility and that agility within your planning um, approach, then you can actually start to mitigate some some of the risk created by putting too much emphasis on too small a group of people in in the uh, you know at any point in that in that transformation initiative. I'm intrigued about the nine pillars in particular. If you could help me understand and explain a little bit of the difference between um, the one pillar called your business model and the other one called your operating model. Yeah, the bus- the business model is very much focused upon how you deliver value to your customers or clients so that that's your delivery mechanism so do you you know what does your product mix look like what does your service mix look like um what's your delivery mechanism are you online offline is it a, 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 you know is it, is it a combination of, of of each you know just looking at how do you interface with your clients and how do you drive revenues through that client yeah. Once you've got that in place, then the operating model element is very much about the back office part. What does your processes look like? What do your workflows look like mm-hmm. to ensure that you can deliver the business model and the value to your customers and clients as efficiently as possible? So top line and, and uh, but the, again, the analogy is almost as, as a business model, you want to project yourself as that swan gliding a, along the lake. Yeah, the operating model is all the stuff that's beneath the water, paddling like hell to make sure that it does deliver what, what, it, what you need to deliver in, in the best possible way. In every transformational experience, I'm sure personalities get in the way. And in a lot of organizations, let's just say the top C-suite management sometimes uh, believe or overestimate their importance in the transformation or in their ability to guide the organization. Let's call that ego. How do you work with individuals who think they already figured out what you're doing and they can do it better and ego takes over? How do you get them back in line to say, we all have to be rowing and communication can't be just about you and your ego yeah you've you've hit it the, the nail on the head i think that, that that is a challenge that we find all too often when when we're engaging with with organizations and and key part of that is i suppose the key skill set of any transformation leader is sometimes you're you're a coach sometimes you're a, a guide sometimes you facilitate discussions sometimes you need to challenge and do that review it's those skill sets of bringing those together at, at, at all relevant points and yes you know there are occasions where you um, you identify individuals that are exactly as you just described you know looking at you and saying well what value you add in i can do this we've got it clear all that sort of stuff but it, it's just a matter of that they're saying that they tend to say that because they They've got some more underlying concerns. That could be a more underlying concern about what the impact upon them has. So it's almost an initial defense mechanism that they're, they're, they're going on the attack rather than, you know, as, as the first form of, the, of defense as such. So it's trying to understand them as individuals. Um, and all too often, you, you, can, you can fall into a trap of saying everyone's the same. We're not, you know, ultimately as a transformation, there's lots of ingredients that's going into that big pot. And we've got to make sure that all the ingredients go in at the right time and and that so that it creates the the you know the, the meal that we, we, we want it to, to create. So that having that ability to really go and engage with the individual and try to understand what the motivations are around saying the things that they're saying. You, you just need to strip back a little bit and, and understand it at a more sort of detailed level. 
And by spending, what I find is by spending that time just engaging with them and and, and asking for their um, opinion, asking for their thoughts, for their guidance, and being empathetic and, and, and almost asking those, it's probably, a, a, I think it's a Scottish term, the numpty question, the, the questions that, you know, people should be asking but don't ask because they've been too involved. That's where you start to unpick a lot of these um, challenging situations. So, yeah, I think it is just a case of being humble, talking to people, opening up, um, being um, having that ability to, to, to ask for them to get involved as opposed to trying just to, to push them to, to, to. Tony, a large part of my career, business professional life, has been spent meeting with individuals who own businesses, C-suite type of people, talking to them about their problems, how do they improve their business. And it's obvious to me that you are very well grounded and you know what you're talking about. And you touch on points that most people don't think about or don't touch on. So my compliments to you on that. Well, what is you. it? in your life experience, your background that led you to develop that mindset of inquiry, but also getting into the details, not just the broad brush strokes that most people talk about when they talk about transformation. Well, I think a lot of it comes through experience. You know, we've, we've all been um, in those situations where you, you try one approach and it doesn't work. So you either keep trying the same approach and it still doesn't work. Or you change and you try different approaches, and and uh, you know I suppose that's the value of of having twenty odd years experience of doing this. Uh, it would be foolish of me to say throughout those years every interaction has been successful because it hasn't, uh, and you learn as you go along. And um, uh, but I I think it you know what I what I've been able to glean through my career and through talking to other people is that there are some clear skill sets um, that can differentiate a transformational leader from just a functional leader or, 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 or within in, in, in any, any organisation. And it is that ability to inquire, to challenge, to put your arm around people and, and be a coach at the, at, 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 at the right time. And I think that almost, I'm, I'm just here to, you know, I'm here to ensure that we deliver this vision. Yeah. And if you don't want, if you don't agree with that, then l let's have a conversation about it and let's understand where the differences of opinion are. Uh, but let's, you know, we, we, I can't do it on my own. You can't do it on your own. It's a team effort. We need to move forward. So let's agree what we, what we, so it is about getting that alignment. It is about building team and equally, um, I think uh, that sort of um, third ground attraction where you're knocking down the rabbits that keep popping up, that's what we do, isn't it? It's just constantly looking at the challenges, keeping the plate spinning as, as, as you go through the process and trying to get one step ahead so you can start to identify where the risks are and identify where the potential problems are going to be and proactively approach those to try to mitigate and minimize the impact of them because it's not it transformation isn't a straight line we might say we're here we want to get there and put a straight line it's never like that you've got to be agile you've got to iterate you've got to, people will that you think are on board will suddenly fall off track people that are you you think are never going to come on board will suddenly be your most biggest supporter You've just got to, you've got to flow with the uh, you know you've got to go with the flow shall I say and 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 work with the with the assets that you've got and and look to mitigate any risk that you've got as as you go through that process. Growing up, both your personal life and professional business life, who were your role models that guided your thinking and your activities and? Kind of got you jazzed up, got to the emotional part of you, and got you excited. Well, that's an interesting question. I, I think, um, yeah, I, I, I was fortunate enough very early on in my career to um, someone bought me a uh, Nightingale Conant's 
uh, six audio tapes, um, Brian Tracy. Um, so that was one of the first ones that I, I, I listened to um, and, and then got introduced to people like Tony Robbins. So all of that, you know, it's within ourselves. It's, you know, it's the stuff that we do and the focus that we have on ourselves that can have influence on, on other people. Um, that came quite early. Um, I think there's a, there's, within my career, there's been a, a, have been a few people that have, I can look back and say, yeah, you made a real big impression. Um, uh, and the way I, the way I've realized that is that there's some of the things that they, they said 25, 30 years ago that I'm repeating still now. Um, and there's, there's, there's one guy and you know, know who he is when, when, it, when, if he listens to this. Um, but he has a phrase as, um, because it was in the bank when we were, we were looking to drive this big transformation and we were working with um, bank managers, branch managers that had been almost having their own little fiefdoms in, in, in the past and were looking to change the whole approach. And, and Mike came out with a phrase once that I, 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 I use repeatedly um, in, in that it's people don't care about what you know until they know that you care. And th that, in a nutshell, in terms of the way that you need to manage people, the way that you need to interact with people, is, is, has been something that I've, I, I've, I've just stayed with me for the last 25, 30 years. Excellent. Tony, you're a very insightful person, and I think you do care. You care about the work. You care about your transformation and trying to build a great body of knowledge and impacting people. What lies in the future for you? Well, I think part of the future is about continuing to help organizations to successfully implement transformation. But part of that is also to help individuals who want to build their career in change and transformation. So that was uh, one of the catalysts for uh, writing the book uh, and collating the information that within the body of knowledge. It was the catalyst for the Transformation Leaders Hub, which is a community, global community, for people who operate in change and transformation to come together. Yes, there's lots of information in there about how to do certain things or lessons and, and, and stuff about how to drive um, transformation within organizations. But a big part of it is the community aspect. It's people coming together and talking to each other, the peers. And as, as you are leading organizational change, it can be quite lonely. And sometimes you just need a shoulder to, to cry on or a second, a second opinion on something. And that's what we're trying to create within the, within the community. But it is about building that capability within organizations to successfully deliver transformational change and grow and be as successful as they can be. And that's where I enjoy the day-to-day -day activity in the consulting side and, and the people that I come get, into, uh, get involved with through the community. It, I think it's the same element that really drives them and to, to get up every day and, 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 and do things within organisations. I was, I was having a conversation last week with a fellow Chief Transformation Officer uh, and Anne-Marie was saying, it's, a, it's, it's just a brilliant job, isn't it? It's, you know, where else do you get the opportunity to go in, drive change you know, in, in, with people? And where else do you go in and get to one day talk to the chief exec in the morning and the frontline staff in the afternoon and, 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 and customers the day after? You've, you, you, it, it allows you to do so many different things. Um, and fundamentally enjoy what you do. So how does somebody who wants to join the community, where do they find you? How do they get in touch with that community? So the website is the transformation leaders hub dot com. Um I'm I'm on LinkedIn, Tony Lockwood um on LinkedIn and um and, and FSP, the consultancy is fsp.co. In building your community, 
What's the biggest challenge in building a community that you had to deal with? I think, I suppose like any community, it's getting people interested in it and understanding what it is. Um, and, and also then getting engagement within, within the community. What we found is that um, it's the typical 8 to 20 rule. Um, 80% of people within the community are quite quiet. Not to say that, they're, they're, that they are um, not active. They just don't get involved in, in that many um, interactions with people. But of those 80%, probably about half of them are listening. And you know, if something piques their interest, they'll, they'll, they'll jump in. But the, the, there's twenty percent that are very, very active, um, and it's 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 about just listening to what their needs are. It's although yeah, I set the community up. It's not it's not my community. It's their community. So it, it's you know my role. I see my role as creating an environment that they can thrive, and and and, and, and creating an environment that delivers what they need to help them to be as successful as they can be within their community. Uh, and what we're trying to do moving forward is to bring people in that are seeing change and transformation um, as a future career for them. So, you know, we're giving them a, a, a path to, um, to, to, to go down to build that career um, right up to, as ideally, Chief Transformation Officer. Um, so, you know, we're trying to build that, that roadmap for them as well within the community. Tony, you have a lot of different channels that you use to communicate, touch people, outreach into the world of business. What's the easiest way to get in touch with you? Um, probably through LinkedIn. Um, um, or, or, you know, yeah, yeah, probably through LinkedIn. Sorry, through LinkedIn. Okay. Tony, had a great conversation today. You're very insightful, caring individual. I think you're very effective in what it is that you do. I will appreciate your time very much. And I want to thank you for being here and your time. And I look forward to future contact and conversations with you. Well, thank you very much, Ted. It has been, uh, it's been great to have a conversation. And likewise, it'd be great to uh, keep in touch and uh, continue the discussion. Hi, Ted Wolf here. I want to thank you for joining us for this Implementers video. The Implementers podcast is presented by Guidewise, where we, along with our vetted member community, recognize that ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. To learn more about getting things done with Guidewise, please visit us at guidewise.io. And to conquer your implementation struggles, please like and share this video and subscribe to our channel. Happy implementing.